Hopefully this is working. Um, I am Janet Kovac McLaren. I'm the soft tissue surgeon and clinical director at London Vet Specialists. Uh, we are the only specialist referral center in central London um, and part of the Linnaeus family. Um, we have a broad range of specialists here in beautiful Hampstead, Belsize Village. Today I'll be running through um, at a really timely topic, which is um, information about BOAS patients. So as the weather gets warmer um, and as the population of brachycephalic pets continues to increase, um, we know that this is a definite issue. So I'll go through a little bit about how to deal with these delicate patients in an emergency situation, a little bit about the ins and outs. So if you are having these patients present to you in an emergency setting, and you're recommending that surgery may be indicated. I'll give you some background information about what to educate our clients about. And then for those of you who are performing the surgery, I'll include some tips and tricks that might make the surgical approach, management, and aftercare a little bit more straightforward. So um, again, uh, I think we're all familiar with the clinical signalment of the brachycephalic dogs and being aware of the signs that would indicate an emergency in terms of cyanosis, dyspnea, um, and in an urgent or emergent setting, they can have fainting as well. Um, we'll go through some of the surgical techniques once we've dealt with emergency stabilization, some of the traditional techniques and some of the newer or novel techniques. And most importantly, a bit more information about how to care for these patients, how to be prepared for the complicating and challenging um, situations as they arise. Um, and again, um, about what to educate our clients about. So, you know, a lot of information has come out recently, um, surveying brachycephalic pet owners. Um, primarily, we see pugs and French bulldogs, but some English bulldogs as well. Um, more and more interestingly is that even though we perceive um, an issue and we'll show that there is some definite quality and quantity of life issues, repeat, repeated um, surveys find that pet owners will continue um, to be very loyal to these breeds, their lovely personalities, um, and the numbers of cases we see continue to rise. So. Um, there's a lot of survey information here. Again, 100 owners were referred for treatment of brachycephalic airway disease, um, and a query of what kind of uh, what kind of extent and severity the clinical signs were and how this impacted their quality of life. Again, more typical signs include difficulty with exercise. Um, you know, they often will have a sit on the corner because they can't walk too far. Certainly, very sensitive to the heat, and of course, lots of snoring and reported sleep problems. Um, really interesting is that um, compared to a uh, non-brachycephalic dog of the same size, which can be expected to live almost 13 years, we're seeing that extremely brachycephalic dogs um, on average live significantly shorter, so 8.6 years. Um, and um, as I said, they have about three and a half times more odd odds chance of developing a respiratory disorder than non-brachycephalic dogs. Um, and I think there was even a more recent article that said that average survival time may be even shorter than that. So sometimes um, even six years has been reported as an average in some newer studies. So certainly we know that it affects their quality of life, but it also appears that being brachycephalic appears to affect their longevity as well. Uh, more specifically, a study actually looked at French Bulldogs versus non-French Bulldogs, um, and it seems like um, they have even a higher propensity of problems than um, your other non-French Bulldog brachycephalic. So um, they seem to be highly predisposed to the stenotic nares, um, as well as brachycephalic airway syndrome. In addition, which is not too surprising, they also seem to be overrepresented with skin issues, ear issues, and dystocias. So French bulldogs seem to differ to other dogs in the UK, as the title suggests. 
um, as a group level of diagnostic uh, cases, they have a lot more, almost 40% higher risk of developing one of those uh, mentioned disorders, the non-French Bulldog. So certainly pretty significant. So it's important for us to realize when addressing brachycephalic pets that there's more than one problem. So there's multiple issues, multi-level diseases, and there needs to be multiple interventions um, that are required. So um, important to note that these pet pets can have issues with their nostrils, um, into the inner part of their nose, they'll have issues with the turbinates. Moving backwards, they sometimes have macroglossia, their tongues are too large, their tonsils can be enlarged, they can have, of course, the more typical issues with an overlong soft palate. They can have issues with everted saccules in their pharynx. And of course, we'll see hypoplastic trachea. And really important to remember, uh, anywhere from 60 to 75% of the dogs may also have concurrent gastrointestinal diseases, such as ulcers, hiatal hernias, and some pyloric stenosis issues. Um, so we'll go through some videos of what a mild and moderate examination might look like. So in that case, just some mild increased breathing noises, whereas in this larger bulldog, more dramatic. And of course, these are both dogs at rest sitting in the exam room. We know that after just a moderate or small amount of exercise, that can become much worse. Um, and then even worse, once dogs become stressed and excitable. And this one just pre and inducting. So clearly we can imagine that these pets live their lives in a fair amount of um, struggling and distress. So moving on to some of what we might see in terms of how we make our diagnosis, um, the first step is often going to be an airway examination. Um, we know that there's not a great gold standard. I'll talk a little bit more about more advanced imaging, scanning, and some whole body plethnography. But as a first step, um, important to recognize what we might, might find on an airway exam. Certainly a struggle for breathing and over long soft palate is visible. More visible here. Again, that soft palate really causing a struggle. So again, obviously a sedated laryngeal examination is going to give you your examination and diagnostic beginnings. Um, this can also be done with laryngoscopy, uh, camera assisted. Um, we will recommend more diagnostics, especially in any patients that are potentially at risk or have already developed aspiration pneumonia. So radiography can be indicated if there are concurrent issues going on. Um, and certainly sometimes CT or advanced imaging can help with measurements of the trachea, measurements of the turbinates, depending on the procedure you're going to recommend. But really the gold standard, which we won't delve into too much, is called something called whole body plethmography, which is this little um, ingenious machine that actually will measure the oxygen oxygenation level of these patients. This is a really important breakthrough because there are 
some patients where the owners perceive them as being normal and not having any respiratory issues. Um, and when they were uh, put through the machines, it was quite clear that even though the owners may not perceive respiratory disorders, um, that even um, what people perceived again as normal French Bulldogs or Brachiosphalic Dogs did have compromised oxygenation. So really important to be prepared for any kind of emergency. Certainly sedation and tranquilization can be very useful in reducing the stress, certainly addressing any hyperthermia. Um, oxygenation certainly is important as long as it's not going to be further stressful, right? So sometimes putting on a mask or stressing out a patient um, can be difficult. Um, generally speaking, flow by oxygen is not going to be as effective as an oxygen cage or even better would be nasal prongs in terms of superior delivery. Um, steroids can be used, especially in patients that do have a lot of airway swelling, but we do remember that there can be some GI side effects. So we do try to avoid them as able, uh, but use them as needed. Um, we really like to have the tracheostomy as the last resort. Um, because recent studies do show that patients that have had previous tracheostomies can have a higher rate of complications. And of course, the tracheostomy site itself is, requires a fair amount of management and care. Um, in a really bad situation, ventilation could be required, um, really looking for evidence of not only just aspiration pneumonia, but some of these patients are also presenting with non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, essentially just from being choked. Um, so saying chest radiographs when these patients are stable, it's not a priority to get your radiographs done, um, but something to do once the patients are stable. Again, all the things you want to have in your armamentarium to make sure you are able to handle these emergency situations. Again, supplemental oxygen. Suction can be really useful if there's a lot of secretions in the airway or certainly after surgery if there's any bleeding. You want to have enough of a staff present to aid and assist your smooth recovery. Anytime you have these patients, you always are preparing for intubation or reintubation, so you always have extra um, tubes, any kind of um, sedations, propofol on, on board or uh, on hand to use as required. Um, making sure in your crash kit you do have preparation for a temporary tracheostomy if you're seeing these patients often because that is a last resort, but it could be required in some patients with such severe swelling or intubation is not possible. Um, having medications on board to help with anxiety. Um, and actually a newer study showed there may be some help in emergency situation of actually using nebulized epinephrine to reduce some of the severity of signs and symptoms. So it could be useful to have that on hand as well. So important is again, when we get to the surgical correction bit to remember um, that there's multi-level of dysfunction. So um, surgery is not one size fits all for every patient and often, um, important to educate clients, as I'll discuss later, that many of these patients will return for multiple procedures and multiple interventions. So um, starting, as I tell people, you start just starting at the tip of the nose, their nares is often too narrow and will require widening. Um, there are some procedures to address their nasal turbinates, trimming of the soft palate, as I indicate here, the guidelines for that, which we'll go into in detail. Um, some dogs will have giant tonsils and some people recommend tonsillectomy, although I don't know that that's necessarily my first line of defense. Looking further into their pharynx and larynx, again, everted laryngeal saccules. Um, there's certain things that can't be fixed and overcome, such as their hypoplastic tracheas. There isn't any way to overcome that, but recommending one or many of those levels need to have intervention. And of course, making sure that um, we don't forget the gastrointestinal signs and symptoms that many of these patients have. So important for us to have a good overview of what to expect with anesthesia in these patients. So there's been a nice um, literature review looking at what to expect for anesthesia and brachycephalic pets. And as you might expect, um, higher perious anesthetic complication rates um, can be anticipated not only um, with longer surgery, which you might anticipate, but having brachycephalic status. So um, good information to tell clients that brachycephalic dogs having any kind of surgery are at least almost two times more likely to have any kind of intra-anesthetic complication and potentially four times as likely to have a post-operative complication. So this is really important information to share with our pet owners. Um, there are some newer techniques that help to ease and improve anesthetic um, 
performance and aesthetic recoveries. Again, one of the things that has been um, looked at is using nebulized epinephrine in order to help with some of the intraoral swelling. They did find that this was something that could be very useful. There were some dogs that um, did tolerate the nebulization and potentially the nausea noted as a side effect, but this might be something to consider um, in terms of your more severe patients having um, that epinephrine nebulization on hand. Again, making sure that we have assessed these patients beforehand to know if they have aspiration pneumonia, they have any concurrent injuries or um, systemic issues. Um, important to realize that their baseline oxygen saturation readings on room air uh, may be lower than your average or normal pet. So 93 to 95% may be normal for these dogs. Pre-oxygenation is certainly very useful for surgery. Um, also making sure, as we discussed, that a crash cart and emergency supplies are always to hand. Um, they can regurgitate and become nauseous, so um, using some anti-nausea medications around the recuperation period can be useful. So serenia um, can be used in these patients. Sometimes um, if they have ulcerative disease, they may be on anti um, amiprazole or pantoprazole medications. Really taking your time with recovery is really important. So we recover them very slowly in sternal recovery. Recumbency, we have suction available, and we always have, as I, as I mentioned, emergency drugs and crash cart on hand. Um, they've looked to see if there's different medications that may be useful, but in general, um, it's personal preference, dexmedetomidine, and acepromazine, all could, both can be combined with methadone safely in dogs that are undergoing OS surgery. So some quick little diagrams of what the patients might look like. Um, these are kind of the before pictures of narrow nostrils and some after pictures. Um, again, before and after. So it's not a huge difference, but if you remember, you're back to your physics and your uh, impact of your radius to the fourth in terms of airflow. Um, just a very small increase in the radius that we can um, widen these narrows really will have a pretty marked improvement and in increase in the airflow. So I always warn people um, that their nose will look a little different, uh, perhaps a bit more round or porcine, just so people aren't too surprised with what to expect afterwards. And again, making sure that these are even dissolvable stitches, um, but that the patients don't scratch them out um, prematurely. So buster collars can be very useful. Soft palate hyperplasia is really the mainstay of repair. So um, again, I showed the guidelines earlier with more pictures to come about our guidelines of um, where we trim. You know, more and more, I think people are becoming more aggressive in terms of trimming back the soft palate in an effort to minimize the number of patients having to come back for repeat surgeries. Um, interestingly, they looked under the microscope at some of the soft palates of these pets. Um, and they do find, even on a microscopic level, on a CT and microscopic level, there's an abundance of tissue so that can often be three times uh, thicker than a normal dog. And they also have a preponderance of excess of um, mucinous glands in those palates as well too. So um, again, the judging of the length of the palate can be done visually, it can be done on imaging. Um, certainly uh, CT scans can give you um, a, a really nice image of the length of the palate but again, often a good sedated laryngeal examination is useful. So again, an arrow guideline, usually the landmark that we use is the back of the tonsils. You can see here this overlong palate that needs to be trimmed back. But again, you can be pretty aggressive. So uh, my treatment of choice is a bipolar sealing device. So I use the small jaw ligature. Um, people have compared and looked at um, the traditional kind of cutting and sewing using a laser technique or using one of the sealing devices. Um, and our most recent study said that um, using a vessel sealing device is generally faster, as you might expect. Um, it minimizes tissue edema um, and also really minimizes bleeding. Um, and as I said, there, it's pretty quick and easy. So definitely my technique of choice. Here are some quick videos to show you what the uh, ligature looks like and how the procedure is. So I don't fully deploy the ligature, so I do partial de deploy, and this device essentially uh, will you know, essentially cauterize and cut, so minimize its bleeding, um, and in just a few minutes, we're able to have access pretty quick. Uh, 
kind of visual what to expect. Okay. And so I'm going to there. Put it on a towel to keep it trim there. Thick for this. Uh, very thick to make it quite visible, but I find that you can use the vessel to under like the trim and thin the towel a bit. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, and one more to give you an idea of how this looks. So generally, average is about 30 seconds. Uh, this is just a few days. So that's a huge advantage over more traditional techniques. And I do extubate the patients for this procedure. And then we reintubate them just to give them the finish. But for that about 30 seconds time, we have a protocol attached. And then we reintubate. So again, uh, making sure you don't pull too much on the traction on the tongue because that can affect your landmarks a bit. It does seem that um, dogs that are younger at the time of surgery, so under two years of age, seem to have um, slightly better um, improvements of 91% compared to those that we don't get to surgery till they're older. Um, uh, overall, excellent outcome can be expected in about 90% of these patients. Um, it does seem that patients that have are older have also have averted sacros may have a worse prognosis. And again, there are some other techniques, include, including pal palatoplasty, which can reduce some of the bulk of the, um, the palate area as well, too. So this is just a quick visual on a patient um, you see on the right side here before surgery. Um, that's what you would expect. And then this is one of our more recent patients just directly after the palate, you can see there are some averted saccules, which we are about to tackle, but you can see how much more open the airway is compared to a patient um, with a palate touching down all the way to the epiglottis. So pretty significant improvement. And again, this is just after surgery, and you can see really minimal to no bleeding and a nice open airway. So the pharyngeal, pharyngeal area, when it gets obstructed, that can be with the mucosa, again, especially in English bulldogs, this macroglossia can be a huge issue. They can have tonsil hypertrophy and aversion. Um, and in some of these patients, there can be a component of epiglottal entrapment. So all of these can also add a different layer of oropharyngeal and nasopharyngeal obstruction. Um, some of those, again, can be overcome and some cannot. So down in the pharynx area and larynx, we can trim these everted laryngeal saccules, uh, also called laryngoceles because they would also obstruct the rim glottis. Um, the ends, this is what we call first stage of laryngeal collapse when you have everted laryngeal saccules, and that can progress to grade two laryngeal collapse when the cartilages start to touch. Um, and then I'll show some images of laryngeal collapse when you have complete loss of rigidity of the laryngeal cartilages. Um, and uh, again, this may be more common in pugs, but there is uh, a pretty dramatic changes and, and again surgery can be helpful in terms of trimming the palate which has already been done in this patient and trimming the saccules uh, but these patients again I always warn people are never going to be completely normal. Um, saccules can be removed those averted laryngeal seals with scissors or cautery. There are some people who believe that if you remove both sides there's a potential risk for webbing or um, scar tissue in that area, um, although that hasn't actually been proven. So it is a bit of personal preference if you remove one or both averted saccules. Um, so yeah, a little diagram of what this procedure looks like. You can see these saccules sitting in place um, and they can be trimmed. Uh, long handled or instruments are quite useful, especially long handled curved scissors to facilitate those trimmings. Tracheal hypoplasia, unfortunately, is something that cannot be overcome with surgery. So that is something that um, is measured. Uh, initially, it was a radiographic diagnosis, but then CT um, continues to be used. Um, you can do tracheoscopy to identify what the narrow tracheas look like. But again, at this point, there really isn't any repair 
possible. So it's not like the Yorkies with tracheal collapse where there may be surgical options, stenting um, these patients with just a hypoplastic or narrow trachea. There's limited options in what we can do with surgery. So again, a little quiz here. This is an image of end stage brachycephalic disease. So not to be confused with laryngeal paralysis, tracheal collapse or tracheal paralysis, right? It is number C or letter C, laryngeal collapse. So again, a little graphic or schematic of what the three stages of laryngeal collapse look like. One, um, when you have averted saccule, that is by definition, grade one averted saccule or stage, stage one laryngeal collapse. When the cartilages start collapsing inwards, we have stage two. And then when they've completely crossed over um, and sort of melted on each other, that's grade three, which is gonna be more severe. So some images of what you could expect in these really severe patients. obviously a real struggle for the dog. And then when we get inside the airway, you'll see what that looks like on the inside. And you can see the larynx, larynx collapsing on itself, saccules inverted. Um, and this is in the cartilages almost appear to be melting. So again, um, there are people that have tried some techniques with laryngeal collapse. Um, the good news is generally, if you can repair the remaining abnormalities, so the stenotic nares, the um, laryngeal uh, palate trimming, or the, the long, over long soft palate trimming, and potentially moving of the saccules, you can um, certainly improve upon their clinical signs. Um, we do know that these dogs with lender collapse are more likely to um, have, um, you know, a shorter, long-term good prognosis, unfortunately. Um, there have been some initial reports of trying retinoid lateralization. Um, it did work in a few handful of dogs that had some improvement, um, but there was really no long-term follow-up in this paper. So um, other people have reported trying laryngectomy, stenting techniques, or of course, um, the uh, permanent tracheostomy as a, as a late or last option. Um, so permanent tracheostomy has been reported in uh, a series of dogs that had severe laryngeal collapse. Um, they were able to survive about 100 days after surgery, but there was a fair amount of major complications in these patients. So 80% of them um, needed um, more interventions 27% of those were revision, but about half of them did end up um, resulting in euthanasia or death, unfortunately. So there may be some short-term marked improvement in the quality of life, but um, dealing with permanent tracheostomies is a major commitment for these patients, or these, these owners. So stoma care can be really demanding. So again, it's more of a salvage procedure when traditional surgeries have failed. Some of the more novel techniques that have been reported in the last years to address brachycephalic dogs. So almost all surgical papers or surgeons would probably start with a more traditional, which is the stenotic nares and palate repair, plus minus dealing with their uh, laryngeal saccules, but then there may be some further intervention required. Um, and one of those can be um, the late technique, which is um, laser assisted turbinectomy. So um, this is by where you actually go in through the nasal cavities and you're able to laser some of the obstructing nasal turbinates. So um, they require CT and rhinoscopy first in order to measure the degree of obstructing turbinates. Um, and we do find that these dogs do very well. Um, they did find that some of them or a large a group of them did require repeated procedures to laser out the um, turbinates. But again, something to keep up your sleeve um, again, these dogs have a view of what these really large obstructed terminates may look like. Um, again, low rate of overall mortality in these procedures, about, again, about 16% of them required multiple techniques. Um, but again, this can be something to be considered uh, either in combination with traditional surgery or down the line if traditional surgery has um, uh, not proved successful. 
Other things that can be due um, or can be reported is a palatoplasty. So other things, these things are all designed to kind of help not just decrease the length of the palate, but address the dogs with a super thick palate. Um, again, I do find that with the Lickershire device, we're able to deal with some of the length as well as the thickness of the palate. But this is another technique that has been reported in order to address some of that thick or abnormal palate tissue. Um, and again, I do find that these patients had a good improvement of clinical signs. Um, they have a short follow-up time in this um, series, but the dogs did do well um, in over 85% of the cases that were followed in the short term. So a potential, again, um, procedure to have in your armamentarium. So again, what about overall? How do these dogs do with surgery? It does look pretty encouraging that in a survey of about 100 brachycephalic dogs that had multi-level upper airway surgery, um, that there was a striking reduction in the life-threatening events by 90%. So good to report to patients that um, we'd expect um, the big goal of surgery is to prevent them from a life-threatening episode of collapsing in the park, is what I usually tell people. Um, also, a majority of them um, reported a huge increase, or excuse me, a huge decrease in the occurrence of the loud breathing, as well as the sleeping problems and snoring a big improvement in the exercise tolerance and heat tolerance. Um, so they did benefit significantly from surgery, but it's important to remember that even though there's a marked improvement perceived, um, these dogs do remain clinically affected and always remember to tell people their heritable disorders of breeding inadvisable, um, keeping their weight down, always being really careful and cautious, using harnesses, making sure that they are not let into the heat and exercise really um, cautiously, and sometimes that means just in the morning or late night walks. Um, they've looked at a survey of these patients um, and asked their owners what they thought, um, how they did with surgery. And again, pretty promising, about 70% of the owners thought that there was an improvement. Um, this is just after uh, rhinoplasty and pal palatoplasty. So um, the nares repair and palate, over long palate repair, about 70% of them will show an improvement in respiratory signs, according to the owners. So this is good to know. Um, and so um, it may be that we don't have to jump into more of the advanced procedures initially. We can start with a more traditional nasal surgery than palate surgery, which is good news. Um, and as I said, um, they did find that the um, improvement was associated with the severity of the inspiratory efforts on the Ponset score, which is a grading score for brachycephalic pets. Um, so it doesn't necessarily um, correlate with the CT changes, but um, from a clinical perspective, we do see that these dogs uh, definitely show a benefit after surgery. So that's reassuring. So some of the tips and tricks for recovery um, we like to do here, uh, things to sort of keep the dog's mouth open also um, will help with the breathing because they're often not very good nose breathers. So helping them breathe through their airway. Um, nasal oxygen problems would be really useful. Keeping pulse ox monitoring on them as able for recovery is great. And then yeah, this is where we wanna see the nice recovery, low heart rate and nice SpO2 100% as they've recovered. Um, so yeah, how are we doing um, with these patient populations? Again, it does seem that the proportion of dogs that are improved by surgery is over 90%. With some of the more advanced anesthetic techniques being prepared, having oxygenation, potentially epinephrine, that the overall mortality has dropped significantly over the last years from 15% to 4%. Um, and we do see pretty immediate uh, recovery signs of um, improvement. Although I do tell people, expect a couple of days of some swelling. So they may have a little bit of increased noises for the first 48 hours, but that after that, we should hopefully see um, not necessarily a resolution of clinical signs, but a pretty significant improvement. So really important to know that a lot of these dogs will have a recurrence in clinical signs. So um, although they improve, um, one study showed almost all of the dogs will eventually need to come back for an additional kind of nip and tuck down the line. Um, again, really important to be aware that there are complications related to the anesthesia and surgery. Um, so this may mean um, something as simple as having reintubation or oxygenation available to them, uh, but it could be something that necessitates a temporary tracheostomy, 
certainly, of course, aspiration pneumonia, which can be very dangerous or fatal, and a respiratory or cardiac arrests in about two and a half percent of the patients. So it does seem that this study echoes earlier ones, that dogs that have a complication seem to be significantly older. So those dogs experiencing a complication uh, were mean age of five and a half years compared to 4.1 years. Um, and again, good to know overall, the mortality rate is pretty low. So we shouldn't expect um, more than a few percentage points of patients to not make it through surgery. Um, again, what do we expect uh, two months after surgery? So it's a nice image right there, a patient that's had uh, a palate trim and saccule removal, which is debated, I believe, for a dental a few months after. Um, and you can see a much, much um, wider airway than you have seen in the preoperative um, videos. And it's really important to note that brachycephalic dogs that have undergone surgery for their airway, so palate shortening or sacculectomy, are much more stable for future surgeries. So they've looked at patients undergoing other routine orthopedic procedures or dentals and found that they do much better with general anesthesia if they've had ROAS repair. So that's good to know. And again, what to expect afterwards are generally much quieter and happier patients. So can't hear too much there and much quieter than previously. So none of the struggling and labor breathing that we saw earlier. So overall, it's really important to remember that surgery is not going to cure brachycephalic conditions, um, but we can certainly improve upon um, our patients' conditions, giving them a much better quality of life. Um, there may be some newer techniques out there to make yourself familiar with, uh, always being prepared in terms of your emergency drugs, intubation methods, and really important just to educate owners and make sure they have correct things, expectations. So um, there are potential for complications or potentials for recurrence, um, and always that these patients are going to have a bit of a modified lifestyle. It does seem that if we can intervene in these patients sooner rather than later, that is going to improve their outcome. Uh, but the good news is that surgery not only improves their respiratory and gastrointestinal signs, um, but it also does improve their abilities to undergo future anesthetic events. So all very positive to know. So a couple of post-operative, very good looking patients that have had surgery with us here. Um, I popped on here information about where we are and also how to find us. If you do have any questions, again, with the hot weather coming around, we are more likely to see some of these patients. And we do know that if we could catch these patients before they get into a crisis, before they require a tracheostomy or emergency interventions, and if they're at a younger age, that they are going to have a better overall prognosis. So if you're able to identify these patients or wanted to chat about whether or not a potential patient might be a good candidate for surgery, please don't hesitate to give us a call or email us or take a look on our website and you can put through a referral query and we're happy to get back to you. So thank you for your time. Um, good luck and do get in touch with any questions at all.